YouTube, welcome in. The NWSL Challenge Cup group stage has concluded. All teams placed played this past weekend with four teams advancing to the semifinals. We're going to chat about the United States women's national team players, how they performed last weekend in the NWSL. We're going to chat about Alex Morgan, Kristen Press, even Champions League with Lindsay Horan and Katerina Macario. Plus, we are discussing the CONCACAF W Championship draw. It took place last week. Following the W qualifiers, United States takes the number one spot in Group A and Canada. They take the number one spot in Group B. Who is the U.S. going to play? What nations will be the biggest challenge for the United States? And so much more in today's U.S. WNT Hour. Like this video and subscribe to Attacking Third YouTube page right now and join the conversation in the chat because we want to hear from you all. Welcome into the U.S. WNT Hour alongside former national team midfielder Lori Lindsay. We welcome in Sandra Herrera, CBS Sports writer and attacking third host. I'm your host for today, Lisa Roman. You can join us live on youtube.com slash attacking third. Join the conversation in the chat. You can listen to all of the USWNT hour episodes on the attacking third podcast, download and subscribe Apple podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, all the places that you listen to your podcast on today's episode. We're talking about Conca. CONCACAF W Championship Draw, NWSL Player Evaluations. We've got a lot to dive into, but first, Sandra, welcome into the US WNT Hour. How are you, buddy? Sandra in the house, yes! Hi. This is Hi. so Hi. great. I love it. I love anytime we get to jump on Attacking Third and chat about all things soccer, but I really love it when we get the chance to go live. We've been This is something new that we've been doing for mm -hmm. 2022. And I appreciate everybody who hops on and joins with us. It's a, it always adds a fun little element to the show. But this is my first uh, USWNT hour, so I'm I'm hyped to be here. Thanks. We are so happy to have you. I mean, it's usually just Lori and I. We've had on guests before. We're gonna have guests more, but Sandra, this is like family having you here. Lori, yeah, and feel feel you, feel free to join anytime you want. Okay, like yeah, listen, please. just slip right into this um, broadcast or podcast. I guess sneak in once you guys are going live. Like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Just come right into the link i'm sure you can find it but um we've got a lot to chat about today because there is a lot going on but for anyone joining us live on youtube we have a 100 paramount plus subscription to give away during today's episode and we want all of you to win all you have to do is enter your social media handle in the chat and like this video and you get a chance to win a 100 paramount plus gift card you can watch syria Concacaf, champions league nwsl matches They're there's so much that you can watch. So enter your social media handle in the chat without the at symbol, and we will DM you if you win. A lot to come from that. We've had winners in the past. People getting free year subscription to Paramount Plus. It's truly fantastic. Let's dive into some chat, though. NWSL, they just completed their group stages for the Challenge Cup. And we see a lot of players competing in the NWSL. We talked about this last week, which players are doing well, which players we want to see a little bit more from. After this past weekend, OL Reign, Kansas City Current, North Carolina Courage, and Washington Spirit. These are the four clubs that are advancing to the Challenge Cup semifinals in the NWSL. But we saw a lot of goals from national team players. Ashley Hatch gets a brace. Kristen Press, we see her score a goal. Alex Morgan, Christy Mewis, Jalen Howe. Lots of players in the NWSL scoring goals. Lori, I'm going to go to you first. You were on the call for games this weekend, yep. on the sidelines, actually, field analyst. <laughs> so you get a different perspective from Lori Lindsay this weekend. But watching the NWSL competition, what players stood out for, to you from the national team that you saw play this weekend in the NWSL? We're starting there. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the ones you just mentioned with the two, mentioned with the two goals is Ashley Hatch. It, it was interesting. That game was a ton of fun, first of all, because um, we got to see Caroline. Obviously, it doesn't play with the U.S. Women's National Team, but does play with the Brazilian National Team. Uh, her first start, exciting. Both of these teams, I think, um, you know, have had a really good start to this Challenge Cup. Um, but, you know, I think when we, when we think a lot about this U.S. Women's National Team, you think about young players, you do think about Washington Spirit right now because they do occupy – quite a few of them. A lot of them. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, this was a, outside of that game, um, which had some like 
oddness um, to it a little bit too. I think this was a kind of like a weird weekend in general. Just we saw some players step up, but we also saw a lot of players out as well. Andy Sullivan being one of those. Um, but in terms of the Washington Spirit, Ashley Hatch, I think, um, had a really great game. Uh, one of the things that you know, the Washington spirit in general um, coming into this game was like, how can we start off better and, and get off more in the front foot? And so that does um, entail Ashley Hatch, Trinity Rodman, Sanchez, um, you know, a little bit of acquired game, I think from Sanchez and um, Trinity Rodman. But I mean, listen, fair enough. Like it was hot. It was hot. <laughs> um, these players, I think those two are fun to watch or performing at the best. And we've seen them score. And then Hatch has had a little bit of quieter games. And this game happened to, she happened to step up and um, that a lot of rotation with those, um, with their team as well. And I think still to compete against a North Carolina that has like looked really good in the Challenge Cup. I mean, still this um, spirit team that's performing high. So I'm going to go with Hatch. Sticks out to me. Um, I'm I'll let Sandra happy. chime in because I could go on forever about other players and like, I Let's, we not I want to hear from on. Sandra. I want to hear from Sandra about this, but I've got to ask, did you learn anything different being pitch side, not in a booth, not bird's eye view of this match between Washington spirit and North Carolina? Like it is, I have been on the sidelines cause we'll go down there and like say hi to everybody when we're live at games and stuff that I'll tell you, this has nothing to do with the actual game, but the athletes are unbelievable. Like if I played today, I'd be broken in half. Like it, it's just not even, it is, it is so fun to watch. And Allie and I were talking about that because we were down there talking with the coaches and, um, but like, it's awesome. Yeah. Like the, it is, it's so fun to see and be yeah. there live and see the players. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see also the experience. This is why if you're listening to this, get to a game, go live. It's such a different experience than even just watching on television. I mean, it's great that we have all of them streamed or, or on network, but um, if you can go live, what an event. Um, and there's like the, the energy around those two teams in particular were so fun. And like, listen, it got, it got somewhat transitional because it was hot and the players, you know, <laughs> even though there's going to be a box midfield and it was going to be tight in there, like, listen, that the seas parted and that game opened up. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the main thing. The athletes are phenomenal. So fun yeah. to watch. I'm in full agreement with you. There's nothing like being able to catch it live. You just, yep. you catch things that you just aren't able to get on a, a stream or on a broadcast. It's, 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 you're operating on specific angles mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the stream. But when you're seeing it live, you get to move your head back and forth, you get to see all kinds of things. But if we're sticking with Washington Spirit and, and North Carolina, um, yeah, I was really, you know what? I was really impressed with Trinity Robin and her defensive mm -hmm. work. Right oh yeah. Good call. That's game. a good shout. Yep. Uh, you know, I think obviously it's like, you know, for people love, love them some, some goals. They love some home runs. They want to see some things. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I know naturally like uh, the goal scorers will typically be at the, at the top of the docket, but we love, you know, defense and attacking third. And we always try to highlight oh, yeah. that when we can, but I just thought that, <laughs> I just thought that Trinity Rodman just covered a lot of distance mm -hmm. during this this particular game. Maybe it was because it just it just got open very quickly and was very kind of tr transitional. Um, but being able to see teams try to try to isolate or or, or try to limit uh, the attack with the spirit because they they can come at you from all different types of angles. But watching watching these two teams go head to head on this final match day and sort of seeing the spirit try to put this very equal game plan together of, you know, making the attack count when, when they can, but also limiting North Carolina on some things, kind of putting them in, uh, you know, more isolated spaces or more pressure into, into half spaces and kind of this collective coverage. And then I don't know if I, I can't really recall a game where I was maybe more impressed with, with some of the def defensive work yeah. uh, of Rodman. I and I think because a lot of that in her first season, a lot of it was just wanting to see this player and, and what she was tasked with, which a lot of it was like, go, 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 get in the attack, get on the ball and, and try to get behind these lines. Right. And we saw a lot of that in, in her, in her first season last year, but then watching this particular game, it's like, there's, I was like, there's something about this player. Uh, and when it kind of just to maybe give people like maybe an example, and I hate to do player comparisons, but it gave me like some Sydney LaRue vibes mm -hmm. <laughs> when I was yeah. watching Trinity Rodman yeah. in, in this game, because that's another forward who 
kind of prides themselves on like running other <laughs> running at back lines or uh, contributing in defensive coverages. So it just, it just gave me some, some vibes around that. So I would include uh, Rodman maybe in this um, category of, of players, U S uh, national team players that, uh, uh, that we're looking at having strong games, but, even though as a forward, just kind of like on the defensive side of things. Yeah, and I, th I think that's an excellent shout as well. And, and you know, it'll be interesting because when you do think about that team, you do think about the three that we just talked about, Sanchez and Hatch included with Rodman. But, like, if Trinity's doing that work, then that just alleviates some of the pressure for those two and then vice versa, right? And so, it, like, that – the, that front three to me is the best in the league right now. Oh, yeah. And it shows the evolution of Trinity and, um, and, and goodness, the ceiling is still so high for her. It is a bummer that we saw Kelly O'Hara because, you know, I have been critical about Kelly and her play with the national team. Um, some t sometimes depending on her positioning and the balls that she's serving in, but there does seem to be, like a real understanding for her of like how she can help the spirit team of where she can get into the attack and help, um, you know, continue to keep play. So it was a bummer also to see, I'd say Kelly go out because it would be interesting mm -hmm. to see her 90 minutes in that game yeah. and what that would have looked like for her on the attacking side and how that could have pinned North Carolina in, def in defensively a bit more. Kelly um, O'Hara probably would have changed the course of that game ultimately at ending yeah. the 2 2 draw between Washington Spirit and North Carolina. But at the end of Sunday match day, both teams would be finding themselves into the Challenge Cup semifinal, uh, looking at more games in the Challenge Cup before the regular season gets started. Other players that we've talked about before in the national team, midfielders looking specifically in this general area, Christy Mewis, who is with Gotham FC, and Jay. Jalen Howell, who, Lori, we've talked a lot about Jalen Howell, Andy Sullivan in that defensive midfield six role. We saw both of these players get goals this weekend. Um, neither one uh, goal really making that much of an impact in the game. Christy Mewis for Gotham scored on a penalty kick uh, at the end of the first half for Gotham against Orlando Pride in the stoppage time of that game. And then Jalen Howell, she gets the opening goal for racing Louisville against Houston Dash. However, Louisville fall to the Dash two to one in that match. But I, I was happy to see that Christy Mewis stepping up to take the penalty kick for Gotham, not a surprise by any means, but yeah. stepping up and being able to take that for a player like Christy Mewis, who personally I want to see more of from her and Gotham. I've talked to both of you about this separately together that yeah. I want to see more from Christy Mewis in order for her to continue to be an influence for the national team. And then another player in Jalen Howe, the rookie in racing Louisville, who is trying to break into the national team. It's almost like she's getting into the national team because Vlako Andonofsky needs another defensive midfielder alongside Andy Sullivan to play and contribute in that role. And we see Jalen Howe get her goal with racing Louisville, a really nice volley strike from her. It was a defensive mishandle from Houston and it lands to Jalen Howe and she volleys it. It was a really good goal. That's promising to see. I'm hoping that a goal from Jalen Howe in, in club play in the Challenge Cup lifts her confidence and that will translate throughout the NWSL regular season and, and hoping that it translates into national team level and, and that kind of continues to expand and grow. Other players that we've talked about not getting time with the national team, they need to show more at the club level. Kristen Press, Alex Morgan, both of these players drilling down penalty kicks. Did anything stand out to you? If you're head coach Black, Black Wendonofsky watching press and Alex Morgan this weekend in the NWSL about kind of bringing them back into camp ahead of the qualifiers. Yeah, I think, um, I think after this challenge cup, I think with the conversations that we've been told on the media side that the U S coaching staff is having with some of the more uh, veteran or experienced players was the importance of, you know, getting back to club play, getting into local markets and getting into like a, a regular regiment in terms of, you know, getting back to their, their fitness levels and um, getting more into form. I think if we're looking at just these two California expansion sides with, with LA and with San Diego, with, with Kristen press in LA and, and Morgan in San Diego, I don't, I don't know how you look at the challenge cup, and especially, especially sort of that middle half to sort of end this ending half stage of the group play with Kristen Press and Alex Morgan and 
not get them into a camp with some of these other younger players. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's a little, maybe it's a little bit difficult to gauge in terms of this final match day, because we're talking about two players that put away goals on penalty kicks, which is a very essential skill when you're getting into large international tournaments where anything can happen and you have to be prepared for anything. But I mean, when we're looking, for example, even with just angel city with, with how that penalty came to life, it's because of Chris and press doing what she does on the ball and slicing and dicing up back lines. And not only did she earn the PK, she got up and took it and converted it, you know? So there's a lot going on here. I think for these two players in, in particular uh, during this challenge cup, that there's enough there for me to get them back into the mix of these national team camps, but I'm not, I'm not Vlad Godinowski. I'm not making though. I'm not sending those emails or making those phone calls, but I, I really want to see these two players. If they are showing that they are healthy and competing, they got to get back in the mix with this team. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm in complete agreement with that. I, I think like, at this point in time, you know, a year now, we could be having a very different conversation about the mix of like some of the veteran players with the youth and what that looks like. And that will all work itself out, in my opinion. Um, however, I think if you're looking at this point in time, I, I agree completely with Sandra. I mean, these two players have, they seem to be playing with a ton of joy. They seem to be wanting to do whatever it can, it takes to play well, be a threat for their team. And then Sometimes, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that comment about just scoring penalties doesn't mean much, right? Um, but it actually does, in my opinion. It does when you need to step up. There's an Angel City that haven't won a game. Um, you need to convert. You're playing at home. And you have a huge game opening up um, the regular season this coming Friday if you're Angel City. It's about momentum at this, this point in time. If you're not getting into the semifinals, just whatever you can do to build some of that and kind of like feel like you're like, turning the ship around a bit right and in my opinion that was the best game that we've seen angel city they seemed oh, enthusiastic yeah. don't get me wrong portland in some ways is depleted but also is still pretty good looking portland team for having missed some players it wasn't like they just had like scraping to find players off the bench like that was not the case yeah. at all we've seen every single one of those players play before so yeah. it's like and i felt like they seem dynamic. We saw the midfield look to see if they can control Danny Weatherholt being able to have a little bit more of the ball to be able to showcase her ability to help set some sort of tempo. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with Charlie, in my opinion, being a, a threat as well. Um, and that opens, it, that looks very different, right, for them um, and alleviates some of the pressure for Kristen Press. But listen, I think if those players are stepping up and converting penalty kicks when it means the most, I, that I means a lot. It counts. It counts. And, and they're mm -hmm. drawing the penalty kicks too in, in terms of Kristen Press drawing it against O.L. Reign. Another forward we've got to talk about overseas playing in the Women's Champions League. Katarina Macario, she plays for Lyon. Lyon played against PSG. And Macario scored a brace in this one. Lori, did you get to watch it? I did not get to watch it um, because I was it's working okay. on my house. Um, <laughs> so I'm still, still in this renovation process, which we're not going to talk about on this podcast. However, um, <laughs> yeah, we'll do a um, podcast one day. All but I, I followed. I followed. I just haven't watched it. Um, there's one thing, though, that I honestly I saw. I think it was on social media earlier this week about Macario being um, the best striker right now for the U.S. Women's National Team. I mean. Uh, is that even a, is that even the conversation? Cause I kind of think so. I mean, you could put Pew in there, like, don't get me wrong. It could be like, but I think Macario and Pew hands down are right now. I mean, they're, it's unfortunate that we didn't see Pew um, yesterday, but that those two for me have been lights out, like yeah. the best right now in form scoring goals, like just like making it look easy. They really they're have. Amazing. You know, I, I did get a chance to take a look at that. Um, take a look at that game and I just what Katarina is what Katarina Macario is doing right now is <laughs> I, it's, she's leaving me wordless you see me I'm like eh. yeah um I, it's it's just we are witnessing something we are witnessing the beginning I think is what I'm trying to say we're witnessing the beginning of something very special here and I, I'm also like saying that with a little bit of a grain of salt because I think if if you're on the American side of of this audience 
that's not necessarily true. <laughs> I think if you're on the European side of the audience, maybe that's a little more true. Because I think for those of us in this this space, you know, who kind of cover the game, I mean, I, Laurie, I, I'm sure you can attest to that. I mean, we're we're following Macario since our days at Stanford, you know, mm -hmm. Challenge Cup yep. runs and, and, you know, NCAA fixtures and, and seeing this player. So in terms of a beginning, we've, we're looking at this player at a collegiate level, but in terms of now being on a very large stage internationally playing mm -hmm. professionally now for club overseas in France with Lyon for a lot of people, for general casual fans, this is the beginning. I think for many of them tuning in to a player like Katerina Macario. And I think there's something very special to be said about, being able to like be there in the mm -hmm. beginnings of yep. things. And I think yeah, like there's a number of players where you could, you could kind of say that about, but it's also very few. I think players that come to mind, you think of the greats of the past, like somebody like a, like a Mia Hamm, right. For or more present with somebody like a, like a Mel Pugh or uh, you know, in this case, we're talking about uh, Katerina Macario is it Rose Roosevelt. I think I would even include in that co category as well, where you're just sort of witnessing the beginnings of something where, you know, is going to have a very special, uh, you know, ending or, or, or continuation. And this has just been an incredible, and it's not even over yet, which is, I think, which is the <laughs> most wild part for me, but there's just like an incredible champions league performance. Like this is an incredible champions league campaign that Katerina Macario is putting together right now for mm -hmm. for leon for herself you know for mm -hmm. for yeah. i guess you know american audiences who are uh you know trying to make sure that they're able to to, to view her and, and the body of work that she's putting together uh overseas i'm not too sure how many folks can actually say oh yeah i'm able to watch women's french division you know league play often and all the time and on the regular and i'm able to take these games in quite consistently i think that's maybe a little uh, difficult to to do if you're an american fan trying to watch these types of games from a player like macario so when you have these champions league matches a little bit more accessible to much larger audiences it's going to have more eyes on, on on the product on the player and the end result and she's doing she, she's doing what she's doing with Leon, and it's like you're watching this player play and do what she's doing, but she's also doing it alongside some other pretty elite players. And you're talking <laughs> about the you're talking about you've got people who are like already like yes, future Ballon d'Or winner, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, but you're watching you're watching her do this on a pitch with with players like. Out of Hedgeberg, you know, yeah, uh, Audrey, you know, you're, yeah. you're looking, you're, and even on the opposition side of things, mm -hmm. when you're going up against a team like PSG and going up against other attacks with that, that has somebody like a Maria Antoinette Cototo, you know, it's, yeah. it's just, it's, it's just impressive to put mm -hmm. it very yeah. simplistically. It's making Macario that much better because she's training alongside these players and going into competition with them that it, it's so fun to watch. I mean, and seeing her progression as a player from her college days and now into the European and the Champions League and now with the national team, hoping that that continues to go and continues to grow yeah. a little bit. I want to shift away from domestic play for the national team players and dive into the CONCACAF W championship draw that took place last week. The CONCACAF W championship is taking place this summer, July 4th through the 18th in Mexico. And there's a bit of a different format for this W championship. The top two teams from the two groups, group A and group B will earn direct qualification to the 2023 women's world cup so eight teams broken into two different groups, USA and Canada leading each group. In Group A, it's the United States with Mexico, Jamaica, and Haiti. And in Group B, Canada, Costa Rica, Panama, and Trinidad and Tobago. The two third-place teams that will head to the brand new intercontinental play-in tournament with three qualification spots available. So that's all part of this new format reconstruction that's coming into play. However, the winning team of the entire CONCACAF W Championship Tournament will receive direct qualification to not only the World Cup, but also the 2024 Olympics. Then the second and the third place teams will face each other in September of 2023 for the final CONCACAF spot 
in the 2024 Olympics. But the W Championship happening this summer, July 4th through the 18th, hosted by Mexico in Mexico, eight teams, four different groups. The draw happened. It was a little uneventful knowing that the United States was going to lead one group and Canada was going to leave the other. But after the, the CONCACAF qualifiers, there was eight teams to be chosen from into these four different groups. After this all shook out, you have group A and group B initial reactions to the restructuring of the CONCACAF W championship and the qualifiers, how that all played out. What what are your initial thoughts on this group A and group B? Uh, Lori, we'll start with you on this one. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, um, you have the top two, as you mentioned, going from each group. So, I mean, it's exciting times. Um, and also, holy cow, this is going to be a tough group, regardless oh, yeah. of how, like, if you think about for the U.S., Mexico, Jamaica, and Haiti, like, I'm sorry, that this is the toughest World Cup qualifying we've had. And, and it just continues to go to show, like, how the women's game is, the, how it continues to evolve, right? And I think... You know, Mexico last year when the U.S. played them heading into the Olympics, um, I think both games, if I remember correctly, are 4-0. However, <laughs> that's not how that went, right? Like, there were moments when, and like, I liken Mexico in some ways to like a Barcelona. The way that they can move the ball, the way that the, the confidence they have. I mean, all these players are playing consistently now right? So gone are the days where these teams also are like showing up, which was like the best thing for the U.S., which was the fear tactic, right? Exactly. Knowing that um, we're the number one team in the world and you had players consistently playing professionally. If not, we were in some sort of residency together. It was a team that was training together. Gone are those days. And then that's why this dialogue to me is so interesting. And we keep talking about the performance of the national team and do you mix in the veterans? Because the mentality and the understanding of what it's going to take to get through the grind of some of these games is going to be just as important as the performance because the gamesmanship is going to be needed. The understanding if a team's going to sit back, if they're not, how do you adjust? Do they do both in each game? Um, the discipline mentally to just like continue like to stay calm, um, which is not what we witnessed at the Olympics for a maraud of reasons, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. and like, so it's going to be interesting. And um, it also makes it, it makes it exciting because I feel like that's what we're going to see in the World Cup and you need to be ready. Exactly. So, yeah. exactly. I think the expanded formats of things are just going to be, you know, we're just going to see added benefits to the fact that yep. there's just sort of the, re the restructuring of, you know, CONCACAF W qualifying broken down to how it's been broken down to for this cycle and then obviously for the future it's just a, a different level of competition i think that we've seen uh from qualifiers in in the past you know when you just sort of had you know certain regions specifically kind of going head to head on their own but then to sort of have this this more expanded qualifier format where you had 30 teams over six groups going head to head competing for six spots for this championship qualify a world cup qualifier in the summer um i think is a really good really good build up and when we're talking about this draw specifically that yeah there's there's only two groups right so it's hard to you know for some people to be like is there even a group does that type of concept even exist a group of death when you're talking about eight teams yeah and, and two groups. <laughs> yeah and we're over here like yeah man yeah. <laughs> it does it, it, there is one and it's group a with mm -hmm. you you know us and mexico and, and jamaica and and, and haiti uh, you know i think when we're looking at uh a, a type of big three you know right now that we're for this CONCACAF team it can't be overstated that you've got you know the number one ranked team in the world the 2019 world cup champions in this group you've got the you know, what is going to be the tournament hosts in Mexico alongside them in this group. And this is a Mexican team that just looks incredibly different uh, than when they went through their qualifying campaign for the 2019 World Cup, a campaign that ended in extreme disappointment, embarrassment, it was a failure to qualify. They were gutted and devastated. And uh, we're looking at this national team now and they're just in a completely different zone than they were 
even in the last World Cup qualifying rounds. And then you have Jamaica, who were debutantes in their first yeah. ever World Cup in 2019 trying to take, you know, these extra steps in their program now in this group as well. It's going to be a very difficult group to advance out of. I think if you are any three of these teams, I, I feel for, for Jamaica, I think it's a tough draw for them. I'm in agreement with, with some of the comments in, in the live chat right now talking about that. It's going to be tough for Jamaica. But the, uh, the other thing of this is, <clears throat> is with this expanded format, right? We know out of this, out of this tournament from this draw that there will be four CONCACAF teams mm -hmm. represented. Yes in the 2023 World Cup, but I want to aim bigger. I mean, there are going to be two teams that go to an inter-confederation uh, playoff. So mm -hmm. there's a possibility that there's going to be six CONCACAF yep. teams in a World yes. Cup, and I'm I'm here for that yes. every day, like 24-7, mm -hmm. <laughs> CONCACAF supremacy. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I love that show. Um, at least I'll just uh, go yeah. one other thing too is like, and just looking at some of the comments, you know, we're seeing um, Steven Cruz Jr. The July 1st game versus Mexico with the women's national team, 29 shots in Mexico five. Yeah, no doubt. Like, do I think that the U S player for player dominates in some ways still yeah. this concave? No doubt. Like, I mean, I don't even think that's there. There's not a real discussion there. However, that's only a piece of the puzzle when you look at all this. Um, and I've been a part of those games, right? Like, and we can dive into that later, but I've been, a part of those games where they felt like there's like a lopsidedness and that's not the results so the whole point is is that like consistently these teams jamaica and mexico um more in, more in particular in this group um with the u.s have players playing at the highest level yes. so that levels the playing field a lot more than it has been in the past then you just add in that it's soccer, right? Anything can happen. These players consistently know gamesmanship. They understand it's going to be in Mexico. It's going to be hot. There's going to be a lot of different factors that will take place with two games in between or two days in between, excuse me, these games. So it's a yeah. quick turn, turnaround. So there's so many factors to, to um, take into consideration that, um, that I just think continues to like, decrease that gap even more so than regardless of the ranking by FIFA or, or what happens. Right. And so, um, yeah, that's why it makes it's it also, the best it's also like when it comes to those type of numbers. I think they're they're because there's big differences and they're two different, completely different numbers. There's a tendency to get kind of uh, fixated on that stuff. Yeah. I know I've been guilty of it too. Like, well, let's just look at the numbers. Let's just look at the data. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're looking at uh, the game stats, shots versus shots, or even just something like rankings versus rankings, you know, maybe on the service level, it sort of feels like it might be an uneventful competition or possibly lopsided, you know, and I'm not going to say that there might not be some areas in which there are some more dominant scorelines. I mean, even with just the preliminary qualification of events that took place in February and April, we saw some separation of teams within, within these 30 uh, national teams that were going head to head, you know, we saw Mexico, you know, dominate uh, their group ultimately, and it had to come down to a final match day against Puerto Rico. And they were never looking back. It looked like Puerto Rico didn't have a chance on that day because of how Mexico came out to play. You had Haiti putting up 40 plus something goals yeah. in mm -hmm. their, in their group, you know, uh, there, there are areas in within the quali qualifiers where you could see that there are still some, gaps that need to be closed a little bit but that's also mm -hmm. kind of part of the point of this kind of reformatting with mm -hmm. CONCACAF W uh, and sort of having the reformatting or the expansion of some of these uh, tournaments or the or the paths to qualifying or the paths to the championships uh, because that it's it's been evident for multiple years now that they want to see more competitive fixtures coming out from this region and within within these moments. And I know, Lori, you've been giving us the experience, you know, of of, of having to prepare for these things, and and maybe you can even shed more light on that for mm -hmm. us, you know, because we're talking about gaps. So we're mm -hmm. talking about 2022 compared to 2010. That's a long gap, you know, and we want to, yeah. I think we're in a place in time now where we want to see less of that. We want to see less of those wide gaps. Like instead of looking back at the history of CONCACAF rivalries, when it comes to the women's side of the game, I think we want to see less time between that. We, we don't want to see 
programs, uh, you know, not being funded or not being given the, the resources and the yeah. tools to compete so long apart. Uh, it's it's unfortunate that we're getting uh, hyped about a qualifier like this in terms of the com possible competitive level that we'll see, you know, 10, 12 years later down the line. Mm -hmm. From the it's, last it's, time, there was yeah. some head to head between us and mexico yeah there's so many varying factors that come into this all of the points that laura you pointed out and, and playing in mexico I gotta give a shout out to lucy in our chat do you want to become be a producer you're dropping in some fifa rankings here mexico 27th <laughs> jamaica 51 haiti 61 i love it lucy but there are so many different factors that come into play about Playing in Mexico, having eight teams in this, starting with the CONCACAF W qualifiers that played in February and then in April, many, many matches to open up the field and get more teams and nations availability to play. We're going to talk about all of this. We're going to dive into the details of this playing in Mexico. We're going to pick Lori's brain about doing it for the United States women's national team back in 2010. We got so much more to chat about here on the USWNT Hour, and we'll be right back after this quick break. Look, we want to make a movie. Paramount is going to come crashing down. We need hits. I got no cast. No Pacino. Brando. He's a nutcase. Can one thing go right with this picture? This movie makes my people look like animals, and that ain't gonna happen. I'm not running. Welcome back to the USWNT Hour, along side former United States women's national team midfielder Lindsay and CBS sports lead soccer writer for the women's side of the game, Sandra Herrera. I'm your host, Lisa Roman. We're talking about the CONCACAF W championship that is taking place this summer in Mexico, July 4th through the 18th. The winners of these games get to go to the women's world cup. It's eight teams two groups each team plays in three games in the group stage it's single round robin type of style the top two teams from each group qualify for the knockout rounds with single elimination it's a little bit of restructuring and reformatting this year with world cup qualification olympic qualification gold cup qualification all on the line but one very important factor that we need to look at is these CONCACAF W championship matches are happening in Mexico. Shout out to everyone who is joining us live on YouTube right now in the chat. We want you guys to win a $100 Paramount Plus gift card. So be sure to like this video and drop your social media handle, Twitter or Instagram in the chat without the at symbol for a chance to win a $100 Paramount Plus gift card. We want you guys to win. Drop your social media handle in the chat but this chat you guys are here for us and i love it i gotta give a shout out to tj trex saying that mexico playing in mexico this is a big factor coming into this uh some other people making shout outs christopher meister saying that us is playing on a way soil in front of away fans for these concacaf w championship and it's world cup qualifiers on the line i want to talk about this how much of an advantage or rather disadvantage for the u.s does do they have going to mexico for these qualifiers and how much of an advantage is it for concacaf and soccer as a whole to have these being played in mexico in front of home mexican fans sandra what are your thoughts on this being played in mexico listen I love it. I think that there's been <laughs> bias here. That's why I want to go to you first. <laughs> listen, listen, I appreciate the space and the floor when it comes to talking about this Mexican national team. I'm I'm here for it. I think it's been something that we wanted to see for, for quite some time. I think for those of us in the space, people who are even just neutrals, right. Of this, of this sport. Uh, but you want to see it happening when, there's a time like this when you're when we're watching this Mexican national team do what they're doing off of the the groundwork of a domestic league, right? So we didn't see that from this Mexican national team during the qualifiers in 2018 for the 2019 World Cup. The 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 league at the time, Liga M MX Femenil, was was still very young. It's still a very young league. Mm -hmm. uh, it's under a, a decade uh, old, uh, unlike uh, some other leagues out there. 
but even at that time, it was an incredibly, incredibly young le- league. And some of the, the storyline and the narrative around that then was, hey, we should see a certain type of energy or fight or, or, or play level of play from this Mexican side during qualifiers because, hey, they've got themselves a league now. And what happened was they got bounced. They failed to qualify. Mm-hmm. That's what happened. So I think in light of all that, it's part of what was uh, so gutting about you know, not being able to qualify was that this league was just getting off of the ground. And then you're not heading over to a World Cup, which we know can provide a lot of eyeballs and a lot of gauge, a lot of interest uh, within uh, programs uh, throughout the world. So now here we are fast forwarding to qualifiers now for this 2023 World Cup. And you've got a league that has generated so much interest you're talking about a league that when it enters its playoffs components from from you're talking quarterfinals semifinals all the way through to their grand final it has eyeballs on it non-stop you have people who are looking for for streams some kind of way you have people who are are going to team channels specifically to try to catch team specific streams of these playoff games and you're you're witnessing huge crowds in these stands now it's going to be this championship is going to be in monterrey mexico where where you've had teams like tigres feminil and you've had the rayadas coming through multiple times during uh championship finals in liga mx feminil and it has really sort of set this stage for big events and now it's going to host a large international event. It's going to be welcoming in multiple national teams. And because it is very close to the United States, it's probably going to see uh, some other types of fans other than Mexican fans. It might have a lot of uh, U.S. fans coming in mm-hmm. to make some noise as well. So I'm very, very excited for this. Uh, yeah, I would absolutely love to see Mexico upset the United States. I am going to say that on the United States Women's <laughs> National Team Hour because <laughs> put it on record. Uh, I am I uh, because look, we're talking about we're talking about this championship qualifiers, you know, and it's got more than one team in it. Despite us talking about the United States United States Women's National Team Hour on this on this show, but it's you've got eight teams total here, and. Uh, if there's an opportunity for some other teams to make some noise, I'm I'm here for it. That's I think is one of the main differences yes. between covering this side of the game versus the men's side of the game. And I think Lori can also attest to this too. There's a, a certain level of growth and building that I think is trying to have like that we're trying to cultivate on this side of, of the ball. There's a lot of things that don't translate from this rivalry on the men's side of the game between United States and Mexico that doesn't translate to fan culture on uh, the non-men's side of the game. It's a little bit different because it's still growing. Mm-hmm. And these are things that a lot of people are trying to grow and nurture and cultivate in their own ways, you know? So we're going to see how this plays out. I'm not going to sit here and act like there's not a chance that me- that that Mexico is going to, you know, crap the bed and maybe, <laughs> you know, and maybe do something. I'm not going to sit here and act like that's not possible. Anything is possible. We're, we're, we're seeing, about. we're seeing two sides of it. You're saying yeah. I, I want Mexico to win, but also like, Hey, they may not. Our chat they is loving not. that. You know, there's a, there's, tell it how it is. There's, I, I there's a, it. there's a lot of pros to, to being the, the host team in an event like this. But there's a lot of pressure yeah. that comes with that too. There, mm-hmm. this team is absolutely motivated by their their failure to qualify back in the previous World Cup, and they're motivated by wanting to show off the soccer that they've been playing, their style of play. But with all of that great stuff comes a lot of pressure. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna see. We're we're not gonna know till we know. Lori, <laughs> I want to ask you because you mentioned player for player. The U.S. is probably better than a lot of these other teams. However, there's so many factors coming into this. And before we take a trip down memory lane for this 2022 CONCACAF W championship happening in Mexico, how much does that affect the players being at an away stadium when most of their friendlies has been here? Yes, they did go to Australia in November. But how does that change things for the U.S.? Well, I think it it speaks to what Sandra was saying. Like, I I think that... 
you know, depending on what the what the eyes on the games are, what the um, fans are like, how, how packed are these stadiums? Could be could be a massive difference, or much to what Sandra was saying too, in terms of like if you just look at the men's side, right? What is what is that like when our men's team just recently went to Azteca? That place used to be brutal to play in, right? And for different reasons. Um, traffic outside the stadium, a ton of different things <laughs> taking place. It wasn't nearly as scary, right? Like, um, in quotes, scary um, and, and difficult to play there. So, like, listen, I think that there's there's an opportunity for be to be really challenging. I mean, again, how 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 are the fields mode? Right? Are they yeah. going to be so? There's so many factors that go into this of like we call gamesmanship, which yeah. is like like. Are you watering the fields? Are you mowing the fields? Are they going to be super slow? Are they, um, are teams going to kick the ball out and make it disruptive every single ch chance they get? That's not, I understand that this is, these are like some hypotheticals, but these are also realities that take place when you are trying to um, head to and, and qualify for a World Cup. And I don't think we've talked a lot about this in the past because, yes, the U.S. has been dominant, right? The U.S. has been dominant for the most part, and the women's game continues to grow. So these are going to be con continue to be factors, though, going forward as the gap continues to, to, to grow and you're finding any sort of edge to take place. Um but playing in Mexico, I mean, these are just things that are going to have to happen and yeah. you have to overcome it. I mean, it's like a World Cup qualifying, right? And like, listen, it, it I'm here for Sandra and this is. Mexico team. I am here for all of this, right? Yeah. And do I have so much respect and like belief behind our U.S. Women's national, national team? Yes. 100%. And yeah. I also realize, again, the general dialogue is our young players and when you look at some of the performances uh have they been the most convincing in terms of no not all of them right they not all of them have mm -hmm. so there's still a lot of question marks on the u.s side which yeah. is totally fine right and um and so we still have a couple months i think things will hash themselves out in terms of player personnel and availability what that looks like there'd probably be some tough decisions for vlaco no doubt um but outside of that um honestly at this point in time it's really you just have to get out of business regardless of where you're competing exactly and that's the and, mentality and that i was exactly speaking. Exactly. And there's so much on the line. I mean, uh, we talked about Group A being potentially that group of death with the United States, Mexico, Jamaica, and Haiti. Uh, Jamaica, I think they have a chip on their shoulder. They had a great uh, W qualifiers run just dominating throughout that play. Haiti, they are looking for their first World Cup qualifiers coming into this. They they were one of the best teams throughout the CONCACAF qualifiers. 44 goals, zero goals against. Mexico, zero goals against. They also have a lot on the line playing in their home country. And then when you look at Group B, these teams are also playing in Mexico, no, not against the host country in this initial round. But after that, the top two teams from each group will move on to the elimination round between Canada, Costa Rica, Panama, Panama and Trinidad and Tobago. Panama and Trinidad and Tobago looking for their very first World Cup qualifying. So there's a lot on the line between all of these different nations. And they're all heading to Mexico to do this. This summer, July 4th through the 18th, we're going to talk so much more about it. But I, I want to dive into Lori. Hi, Lori. Welcome <laughs> to the USWNT Hour. It's where I get to ask Thanks you. Thanks for having me, everybody. 2010, United States plays Mexico at Mexico, it's the underdogs versus the heavyweights, the underdogs being Mexico and the heavyweights being the United States. Pia was the head coach at the time, women's CONCACAF championship semifinals, United States loses. You were there at the top of this hour, you mentioned playing in Mexico, that 2010 memory, it comes back to you. It's no joke. Why? Why does that give you those memories? Tell us about this day. Because <laughs> it was like the us. wildest memory outside of some <laughs> of the games that we played in that World Cup that we eventually qualified for, but almost didn't. So listen, here's the thing. Like we we went to those qualifiers. We stayed at a um we were in they were in Cancun. We stayed at this resort. It was like the best qualifiers turned into like the worst thing you could possibly imagine, right? It was during um, Halloween. We had celebrations. Like we, you know, we were steamrolling through these qualifiers and then we're playing Mexico. And 
this is where the tiniest details start to show up because typically the day before a game, you go see the stadium. Mm-hmm. Something happened with our the timing that, that we were allowed to go to the um, stadium to train. It didn't fit with our schedule and what the coaches wanted. So we opted not to, which was the wrong idea because anything can take place in these qualifiers. And this is this is in 2010, as you mentioned, where there was a huge gap. Merida, 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 let me get the name. I, think, Mary, I, know, I know you're talking about. Yeah, Mariel Dominguez. Sorry. Yeah, Mariel I almost Mariel said Mary Bell, and that's not what. Mariel Dominguez ended up scoring one of the goals. Fantastic player, right? I think leads Mexico to this day in like yeah. um, in goal scoring, right? Um, Veronica Perez ended up uh, Perez ended up scoring the game winner in that in that game. The opening and, goal coming in the second minute. Yes, or I knew it was the first five. I couldn't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah. However, so. You know, as I mentioned, we don't go to we don't go to the stadium. We don't see what's like. Well, big mistake because we show up and this place is packed, <laughs> packed to the brim, and it was like a small, intimate stadium. So I, let's say, I mean, somebody could look this up, Lucy. We probably could use you, um, <laughs> but I think there's like fifteen thousand, right? But it was so loud and intimate because it was on top of one another. And you talk about like the twelfth player. This place was rocking, and the game plan was like get through the first ten minutes because you could you could feel the energy. And like we're here coming in with like a huge discrepancy, right? Like we're ranked number one at the time, probably similar to what Mexico's ranked now in the, in the high twenties, right? And we're te- our game plan is get through the first ten minutes because when the, we yeah. show up, you can feel like, uh, excuse my language on here, holy shit, what have we gotten ourselves into? This is no joke, right? This 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 place is fired up for this. And as you mentioned, they score the first five minutes. We're chasing the game. We do equalize, and then they like. Um, get a game winner not too long after that. Abby's head is busted open. She's getting staples yeah. in the middle of the game. Yeah, exactly. Like it was just, yeah. we could, and we could not get a hold of the game because Mexico was firing on all cylinders. And that is where that's, they're firing on all cylinders. They're fired up. They had the fans behind them. And so that's, those are the things I'm talking about in terms of gamesmanship that like can go either way. Like we were, were we playing our best soccer in that tournament? No. And we were all a little bit all over the place. And it was some, it was really eye opening experience for everybody. Cause we eventually did have to go play away in home matches versus Italy that and we were able to get in. Right. And the rest is history and losing in the final against Japan. But these are the things that are like such close calls as again, the women's game continues to develop and players, right? Like understand what it takes. And that would have still been a time when Mexico would have been like bottling everything they had yeah. inside to say, we're not freaking out here either, but yeah. we have our fans behind us. So let's show up and give it all because actually we're supposed to lose this game according to what everybody's saying. Yeah. Right. So, and, and this is probably where that gap was, even though there are some really good games. And I would always say around that time, even like in the 20 leading up, we played them in the qualifiers, obviously Mexico um, leading up to the 2012 Olympics. And I thought there was vast amounts of time in that qualifying game that we ended up winning for the Olympics as well, that they were a better team than us. So um, in terms of moving the ball, in terms of savviness, in terms of tactical understanding, it was just athletically, we continue to steamroll teams. Right. And so when you can match that, um, and you can you can have equalizers in other areas, then it becomes way more neutral ground. And that's where my thinking is, yes, do I still have like, again, as I was mentioning with the US, I'm like, hell yeah, I'm here for it. Same as um, Sandra is for Mexico. And I am here for Mexico too, because I agree with everything that she said. But like the levi- the playing field has leveled so much that then when you start to at like think about playing in Mexico in front of home fans, if they're going to show up like we've seen w- with their club play and the eyes on it, yeah, there's a ton of pressure, but there's also a ton of excitement, and you know how to deal with that so much better. And so when that gap closes so much more, it's the littlest details in the games that could swing either way, and um, and so. Yeah, I think that that's why th- that makes this is like this is going to be potentially one of the most exciting qualifiers we've seen. And also like we're talking 12 years ago, right? Like we almost didn't make the World Cup. So there's a lot of different factors that um, are going to be important. And and it's going to be about, in my opinion, the right mix. If we're um, with the U.S. Women's National Team, getting that mix right, who you're playing might not be the best 11 
out there yeah. because you're going to have to have a uh, s some a core group that understands calmness, the ability to play vertical at times, the ability to press and yeah. like have some savviness that like I would say that I don't feel like we've seen from our U.S. Women's National Team in a while mm -hmm. in a 90 minute span. So is, is that because of the youth and the different players coming in and, and the changeover we're seeing right now? No, I don't think so. I think you've seen that with the veterans too, right? I think there's been moments where the veterans, I think it's our style of play. I think it's wanting to attack and get on the front foot. I don't fault any, I think that's awesome. And then I think it's also a mix of, it's really difficult if that's the style that you want to play, right? Then to be able to sometimes take your foot off what will feel like taking your foot off the accelerator and then find moments to be even more, um, um, purposeful or that's not quite word, but like destructive in a different way. Right. Yes. So, um, yeah, and, and that's how I view it right now. And and that has been an ongoing common theme, I think around the U S women's national team for even when I was playing, right. Like, yeah, completely. so, and, and how do you continue to evolve? Right. And so, um, yeah. So, so Lori, for you, as someone who played in those 2010 games in Mexico, in that stadium, you had that experience, what's one piece of advice you would tell the U S national team today, those young players say it's the last roster that was called in with a lot of young, very few capped players heading down to Mexico, Mexico to play against Mexico in this first round of the CONCACAF W championship. What advice do you give them? Yeah. One, I mean, it's like the same, like a lot, you hear a lot of time, one game at a time, really. And also do what you can to tune things out because there's going to be so much more dialogue because on the flip side too, that we actually haven't talked about is there is a good chance. And maybe Sandra will push back on this. I'd be curious about your thoughts, but there's also, there's also a chance that there might not be a ton of fans at all in some of the games, which presents a completely different, um, uh, situation, which we saw with our women's national team. I think that was a tough thing for the U S at the Olympics going from playing in front of a ton of fans prior because everything had opened back up for the most part, mm -hmm. having energy, much like we, I spoke about, um, for Mexico in in the final game where, that we lost, but then, then go to Tokyo where it's completely silent. Yeah. yeah. And you have no energy and then you feel flat. So there's a ton of different things that could switch it. And I, I still think there's going to be a lot of fans and I think there'll be again, a lot of eyeballs, but you could be playing in front of like not many and not many that are like, so then the, the field feel. And then again, if you don't, we had, we played in some slow fields that were like, you want to play at a fast tempo. Do you want them to be watered? You want to go and the pitch and the atmosphere does not uh, match up with that. So how do you, how do you find um, the ability to get a result in those conditions? Right. No, I think that's a good point that you bring up too about, about the environment or about the facility coming into play. I mean, you mentioned the, the qualifier match that didn't happen too long ago on, on, with the men's side and in Azteca, not, like you said, just, Traffic around the stadium, you know, COVID, a pan an ongoing pandemic that people are still trying to navigate, you know, things like that coming into play in terms of, you know, butts in the actual seats, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, come game day, that could be a factor as, as well. I mean, just going back and trying to like reach back into like my, my memory bank. I mean, with the two teams in the Monterrey region, you know, in their finals and the fans that they're able to draw, you're talking 40 to 50 K yep. on a Liga MX Feminil day, you know? Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that for this type of match, uh, you know, between us and Mexico, that that will be the, the, more largely attended game, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you, maybe a match like, you know, Haiti and, and United States might not get that type of packed house again. We'll, we'll see. We'll, and we'll see how the team per, performs out of that. Cause I know like we're, we talk, we've talked a lot about this national team and this current, this very current pool of players at the moment and kind of the opposition that they've been going up against lately from, you know, let's just say September of last year to, to now, and how they're being tested or their, uh, what they're being presented with on the pitch. And I know with these most recent friendlies against Uzbekistan, we were putting some things in front of, in front of us saying, well, you know, perhaps if they go up against this team and they're walking away with some low score lines, like one to zero or two to zero, that might be considered a bit of a disappointment mm -hmm. or a letdown. You know, when you're looking at, 
uh, the opposition in, in front of you. So there are some things that are going to come into play for sure. I'm in agreement with you 100%. But my hope is at least for uh, some of these games, whether it's like a, a you know U.S. versus Mexico or like a Mexico versus Jamaica, that there will be uh, some good crowds out there. Yes. yes. Hoping for good crowds across the board. These CONCACAF W championship is happening in July 4th through the 18th. We talked about NWSL players and their competition. Also, Katarina Macario scoring a brace with Lyon in the UEFA Women's Champions League and all about the CONCACAF W draw. Thank you guys so much for being here. Final thoughts? Anything else? Lori, you want to hit us with anything else? Maybe no, I, I said enough. I have <laughs> I said enough. <laughs> I love it. Sandra, final thoughts from you? CONCACAF supremacy. Let's go. <laughs> I love it. I love we're, all it. In, we're literally all in this together. Yeah. I love this. Thank you everyone so much for listening. If you like this video and you dropped your social media handle in the chat, look out for a DM from Attacking Third. You could be our Paramount Plus subscription winner. Follow us on Twitter at Attacking Third for more. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere that you listen to your podcast. And subscribe to us on YouTube to catch all of our interviews and get alerts for when we go live. YouTube.com slash Attacking Third. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you, Sandra, for joining us. It was so good to have you here. Thank you everyone for joining us in the chat we'll be back next monday for another uswnt hour hope everyone has a great monday